Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wolf Packer Show. My name is Ethan McDowell. I am here with Noah Fleischman, and we are your hosts. We're back after a very brief off-season break because if we've learned anything over the past few years of college athletics, there is no real off-season here. Today, it's going to be all portal talk. We're going to talk about transfer portal updates for men's and women's basketball and football because the portal closes today, technically. So it's it's starting to wrap up. We're starting to get a little more of a clearer picture on what both basketball teams are going to look like. Football, still a little bit of a mystery, but we've got some info for you there too. So before we dive into everything happening around the Wolfpack, um, just a quick note that we're both writers for the Wolfpacker.com. That is NC State's site on the On3 network, the fastest growing college um, football and men's and women's basketball um, website out there right now. On3 just launched a women's basketball and women's sports vertical. So go check that out if you're looking for some women's basketball transfer portal updates. Um, and we're going to talk about that today as well. So we're ready to get all into it. Go subscribe there. It is only $1 to join the site right now for your first month. It does not get cheaper than that. Um, and you get access to our premium transfer portal scoops. Um, there's stuff that we're not going to talk about on the free YouTube platform necessarily, but we're posting about it on the website. So go check it out. See who NC State's trending for. See who's trending elsewhere. We've got it all there right now. And um, once these kids commit, we have team analysis going up. We have interviews with these recruits. So just keep, you know, stay tuned on the wolfpacker.com. Go subscribe. It's only $1. Go check it out. And um, we'll see you there. All right, Noah, let's talk NC State men's basketball transfer portal. We'll start off with the men's team because they've been the busiest in the transfer portal so far. Um, so far, let me count four additions so far for men's basketball. One open scholarship left. Let's lead off. You know, actually, no, let, let's talk about um, the, the most recent visitor. Um, we, we've been talking about how they're going to fill this last scholarship after um, Mo Diara's departure, which we will discuss further. Um, they needed a forward, right? You have spent the past week on the site discussing possible forward names, and one that has emerged is Ezra Asar, a sophomore from East Carolina, so right down the road in Greenville. And um, Noah, I want you to give me the scouting report on Ezra, who um, was on campus this week for a visit. Yeah, you know, he told me he was really interested in NC State um, earlier this week and, and was on campus um, shortly after. And it's an interesting guy. Um, you know, he's not the size of, of Mo DR. He's not that 6'10", 6'11 guy that's going to rebound the basketball and get 12, 13 rebounds a game. But he's a good fit, I think, for NC State and what they're going to want to do going in next year. Um, you know, when you look at, at Asar as a, as a whole, you know, he's 6'8", 247. So he's big, just not tall. He can play and play well. He averaged 11.4 points and and 4.7 rebounds this past season at East Carolina, playing mostly in the center spot. But at NC State, if he were to commit, um, I think it, it would be more of a four, more of that power forward spot, playing alongside Brandon Hunt, Lee Hatfield, playing alongside Ben Rodebrooks, kind of doing that. But also can play the five if they want to go small and have one forward on the court and go with four guards with a couple wings. I, I think that would look cool too. Um, but he's a guy who shot well from the floor. 51.4% last year. Expanding his game with a three-pointer, he made six this past season, didn't make any his freshman year, so he's starting to expand. I think if NC State can continue to develop that, if he commits, I think that would make them him a really dynamic player. Um, but it seems like NC State is focused in on the SAR right now, bringing him on campus for a visit with one scholarship left. But there are other options out there. Um, we'll see what they end up deciding to do with him. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see a commitment from him sooner than later. You know, our on three, Jamie Shaw already has an RPM pick in for him to go to NC State. So it would be a good fit. And, and I think that it would fill out the roster well, give them options and things they want to do. But if he doesn't commit, Brandon Gardner from USC dropped the top six yesterday and put NC State in it as well. Don't know how much interest there really is between the two, but he would be a good um, backup option if a Fasar left campus uncommitted. Yeah. So what we're going to do with um, all of these – um, transfer portal additions, and um, we'll do it for a star or two because, um, like we, like Noah said, improvement right now. I think we're pretty. Uh, we haven't put in an RPM pick yet, but Jamie does, and um, you know, Jamie's one of the best in the business. 
So there was positive buzz going into this visit. Um, I don't think anything's changed there. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But what we're going to do for all of these guys is we're just going to look at the role they could fill. Um, you know, you already touched on it with Ezra. But yeah, I think he, he'll be that power forward guy. He'll, he'll bring energy. He'll bring some scoring punch too. I mean, in in the um, in his conference tournament this year, he had a twenty eight and ten game where he hit ten of twelve shots and went off. So like, in, you know, he's an efficient player. Hits over fifty percent of his shots. Um, so he's not someone that's like, you know, some mid major guys. You'll bring them in and they're just like you know, their shooting percentage will be at like 38 because they have to, they have to carry that offensive load. They have to be looking for their shot all the time. Um, it's not, not the case with Ezra. He's an efficient player. Um, he's shown the ability to pile up um, the rebounds. It, if you look at like his game log for the season, it's kind of just up and down. He'll have games with one rebound. He'll have games with nine. So just a little up and down, but I think, yeah, is part of that front court rotation is a, you know, replacing that Modiara, Modiara spot in the rotation. I think he's someone that could fill that role. I think he'd be someone that Wolfpack fans should be excited about. Yeah. It's a lot. So that's something to keep an eye on um, moving forward here. All right, let's move on to, we're going to go through all the commits now, the folks that have actually officially joined the program. Um, and we're going to start with Brandon Huntley Hatfield, a junior from Louisville. He was the first Portal commit to, um, you know, make, make the call. And um, NC State ended his season this March, and um, now they're going to um, – and he was very quickly the first um, portal target that um, they kind of zeroed in on. He committed during um, the Final Four run. So let's talk about Brandon Noah. 12.9 points per game, 8.4 rebounds per game, um, just – I think a really, really solid center who started his season, his career at Tennessee, spent the past two years at Louisville, and has just steadily improved each of those years, right? Um, to the point where he was uh, arguably Louisville's best player last year. Um, definitely one of them. So really, really big addition in my eyes. He's 6'10", 240, so literally he's a big addition as well. He's um, going to replace um, you know DJ Burns in the middle of that um, of that offense. So. Noah, what, what do you see Brandon doing with the pack? How, how do you see him fitting into um, NC State's kind of rotation here? Yeah, I think he's going to be the starting center. I mean, when you look at what he's been able to do, he, he, I, I would say he was Louisville's best player. And it's not the fact that he was scoring 20 points a game. Sky Clark, you know, dropped over 30 on NC State in the AC tournament. He was most consistent. And on a team that wasn't great, last place in the ACC, he was able to be consistent, almost average a double-double. And, and played really, really well, especially against NC State on um, both times at Louisville and then in the ACC tournament. So the Wolfpack got an up-close seat of what he can do and thought, you know what, he'll fit well. This is a guy who, yes, he played at Louisville, but in the portal, Ethan, his top four schools were Pitt, NC State, UConn, and a return to Louisville. UConn, the team that won the national title two years in a row, is interested in this guy. So I think that's, that's all I need to know about what he can do. He's a really highly touted guy coming out of high school, top 30 class, um, top 30 player in the 2021 class. Um, just a really good player. I think he fits at the center spot. He's different from DJ Burns. He's more of a traditional center, something that Kevin Keats, I think, wanted to get back to. Because Keats kind of talked about the final four of the assistants go, like, we need to go find a DJ Burns. He's like, no, no, no. We don't need to find DJ Burns. We need to find someone that fits NC State. And I think that's what they found with Brandon Huntley Hatfield. They brought him in on, on campus in the middle of the run after mm -hmm. they got back from the Elite Eight. He liked it, commits when they're at the Final Four. Um, so it's a good good addition to the class. And he really got this thing kicked off um, in the portal just based on who they lost through the portal. A lot of guys um, that, that didn't make much of an impact this past year just with minutes and the rotation being small, but they replaced them all with really, really good players. And, and Huntley Hatfield, I think, is a guy we'll see a lot um, on the court in his last year of eligibility. Yeah, if you were to ask me who's one guy who could be out of this current transfer class an all ACC player, I'm probably going with Brandon. I, I, I'm just really optimistic about what he's going to bring to the pack. And when he has like more consistent, consistent scoring on the perimeter around him, too, right? I mean, Louisville was just, you know, they, they scored, but um, they were obviously just not a good team. I, I think he's going to be with better players. 
and um, have better coaching at um, at NC State this year. So I'm really, really high on his potential and what he's going to bring to the Wolfpack um, next season. Uh, Noah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. I, I, th I think he's going to be one of the stars of next year's team. So get excited about him, folks. I know it, when we're in the middle of a transfer cycle, I feel like the first person tends to be forgotten a little bit. But um, yeah. Yeah, don't forget about Brandon because he's going to be a big-time addition to the pack here. Um, really exciting player. Next up, another player who um, Wolfpack fans should be familiar with, um, Dontrez Styles. Um, started his career at North Carolina. Um, that's always notable. That never happens. A former UNC player um, playing for NC State. I, I believe it's been like, what, 50, 60 years, maybe more since someone um, has Since like right after World War II, yeah. So yeah. When, you bring so, up, when, when you bring up World War II in the same sentence as anything you're talking about, it's been a long time. So there you go, Dontre style making history here. Of course, he didn't transfer directly from UNC to NC State. There was a year at Georgetown in between. He's someone who um, really liked NC State last year, from what I heard. Like I think he strongly considered coming to he did. Um, teaming up with the Pack when he was um, going through his um, portal recruitment last year. He did not. Uh, he went to Georgetown instead and had by far the best year of his career. Started all 32 games for the whole scored eight, 12.8 points per game, um, pulled down 5.8 rebounds, and just was a really, really good player. He's six foot six um, guard forward guy who, um, Noah, when we're talking about roles here, I mean, I, with the way we're, the recruiting is gone, I think he's someone that you could feel pretty comfortable with putting him as like the fourth guard in a lineup, Put, putting him, I think he can guard shorter power forwards. He's a good defensive player. And um, I think he's going to be, re, uh, he's going to add some versatility that um, I think the pack didn't have as much of last year, just on the wing. But um, I, I think he's going to bring some impressive versatility to the perimeter for the pack. Um, and he's just a, he's a reliable scoring player. And um, I don't think he's going to be asked to do a ton. Like you're not going to have to have him as your like primary ball handler. You're not going to have him as your creator, but uh, he can knock down shots, right? 36.8% from three. Um, just a productive player overall, 43% overall from the field. That's efficient for a guard. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see what he looks like for NC State. Um, Noah, what, what did you think of um, Styles' addition to the pack? It's a versatile guy. He can play the three. He can play the four. And I think that's something that NC State was looking for, a guy that can play both positions, especially with the writing on the wall. Makes it look like we're going to go a little smaller next year and go back to what they tried to do at the beginning of the year and, and, and see if it works again um, this year. And, yeah, he, he, does every, he doesn't do one thing spectacularly great, but he does everything well. And I think that's what makes him such a versatile guy. He can shoot the three, as you said, just under 37%. He shot 47.4% inside the arc this past year at Georgetown. He can get to the hoop. He can make things happen. He can rebound really, really well as well. He had a you know a rebounding offensive rebounding percentage of 7.3, which was third highest at Georgetown this past year. So he can he can rebound on both ends of the floor as well. Um, just really versatile at 6'6", 212. Um, a guy that fits the Casey Morsell role, I think, the yeah. most that they brought in. This is where we're going to see him go in. He can defend pretty well too which is also good to see. And, yeah, I mean, this is a guy who at, at Carolina couldn't really crack the rotation. You know, he averaged 1.8 points, 1.3 rebounds in his two years there. Um, did hit one of the biggest shots in UNC history in a while, you know, in the NCAA tournament to beat Baylor um, and get them to the Final Four, which is a good thing to see because you're bringing back a team with a lot of Final Four experience. He's been in that moment before, hit a big shot. It bodes well for, for what the NC, NC State wants to do at the end of the season. But yeah, experience is a big thing. Versatility is a big thing with him, and and he's got one year of eligibility left too. He came back to North Carolina to do it. Um, back with Kevin Keats, a guy who has not given up on Dontre Styles. Tried to get him out of high school, couldn't get him. Tried to get him out of Carolina, couldn't get him. Got him third time around, and now we'll see what they can do with him. But there's something about his game that Kevin Keats and his staff really, really like. If if they've gone at him three times now to get him to come, and and they finally got him at in Raleigh, so it's a good thing to see. Makes the wing a little crowded. We're going to talk about it some more in a second with, with Mike James. But if you ask me right now, Dontre Styles is in the starting lineup for NC State next year. Yeah, I agree. And um, 
you talked about like Kevin Keats never gave up and it seems like this time around it was pretty cut and dry. Like the second he hit the portal, it sounded like NC state was the team for him. Um, I don't think he visited. We didn't hear about a visit. If, if, if a visit happened, I think he, he just made the call. I think he just made the call to, to commit. I mean, he's familiar with the school, familiar with campus. So um, that was um, big for um, big for the pack. Like you said, filling that Casey Moore cell role and um, adding some versatility to the wing. All right, we're going to dive into the other two additions to the pack. Before we do so, I um, want to say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Game Time. Game Time is a ticket buying and selling marketplace. Whether you're looking for tickets to a concert, a comedy show, um, tickets to see the Carolina Hurricanes playoff run, um, it's all on there. It's all on the Game Time app. Um, pretty much any event you want to find, you can find it on Game Time. You can find the app on any app store or on your web browser at gametime.co. That's .co, not .com. Um, my favorite thing about the app, personally, is it takes a um, really annoying step out of the ticket buying process. Because when you log on, you can see the exact view from your seat that you'd be sitting on if you bought the ticket. I'll hold it up for those watching on YouTube. You can see I have the app right here. You can see what where you'd be sitting if you bought um, this ticket in section 315 row in um, cheapest ticket right now for um, game three of the Rangers hurricane series is $121 uh, before we started recording. No, and I were just talking about how we might use the game time app to go buy some tickets to this game. So we used it to go see um, the hurricanes first round series. So we, we can vouch for it personally. It's easy to use quick ticket buying process, good prices. Um, they don't like, completely weigh you down with fees like other ticket buying um, services do, I think. And um, to sweeten the deal a little bit, if you do use game time, use code WOLFPACK, and that's all caps for WOLFPACK, on, on your first purchase and you'll get $20 off. It's a great deal. Um, made it even cheaper there. And um, go check it out. Game time is on any app store or on your web browser at gametime.co. All right. Let's get back to talking transfer portal stuff here, Noah. Next up is Mike James, um, another player from Louisville. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they, in, in, NC State is going to finish this transfer cycle with arguably Louisville's two best players because Mike James is a very, again, versatile wing player. He's a guard who um, averaged 12.6 points, five rebounds per game, um, shot – you have 39.6% from the field, 34% from three, and 81.8% from the free throw line. So very, very reliable from the charity stripe. And um, Noah, I mean, we, we've been – I feel like versatility is kind of, be, kind of going to be the buzzword of this podcast. I think he's another really versatile guy who um, maybe more so than Styles would just have the ball in his hand a lot more. Not He's not a lead guard by any means, but he'll he'll have the ball in his hand a lot more. Um, definitely like a slasher who can shoot a little bit. Really exciting player. Um, Noah, what does he bring to the pack? Brings two things. One, experience. He registered his freshman year after tearing his Achilles. Since that year, past two years, he's made 64 straight starts at Louisville. This is a guy who's Louisville hasn't been great in either of those two years under Kenny Payne. But he's got experience of playing at the ACC level, playing against these other teams, playing in the venues, playing college basketball as a whole. He's a good player. I mean, he's averaged 33.3 minutes this past year, you know, playing really, really good basketball for them. Um, he's a guy we'll see him at the wing. He can handle the ball a little bit. He In the last five games for Louisville, he played 50% of the possessions at the wing, 36% of them at the shooting guard. So he can be that little two guard for you. He's more of a three, but he can, he can if you want to go bigger and, and play like that. Um, but, yeah, he's a guy that plays a lot. And as you said, he's a slasher. He gets to the rim. You know, he shot 34% beyond the arc this past season, but 42.6 inside the arc. Um, he can get to the rim, get a lot of free throw attempts. I mean, he led Louisville with 154 free throw attempts this past year. Um, getting to the rim, making 126 of them. Pretty, pretty efficient shooter at the line. Something that NC State lacked. And we'll talk about that in the next guy, too. This past year is Getting to the line. They did a good job in the postseason. Don't get me wrong. There was games where in the, in the AC tournament, they were shooting a lot of free throws. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't really find it consistently during the season at times. And the, the portal kind of helped fill that one up. But he can score 22, 
double-digit efforts um, this past season at Louisville, including 10 straight from November to mid-January. And, and, you know, what did he do against NC State? Well, he scored some points, 20 points against NC State in the regular season. So we'll see what happens. But, yeah, he's a guy who's good. And the only thing that I think that they would want to work with expanding his game is being more of a distributor, playing at the two guard, kind of taking some of the pressure off Michael O'Connell, who is expected to be the starting point guard next year. Whew. And you're looking at it where you're going to surround O'Connell on the perimeter with so much defensive versatility with, um, you know, Styles is six foot six. James is six foot five. Marcus Hill um, who we're going to talk about is six foot four. Like it's just, it's going to be tough to score on NC State. You saw the Wolfpack embrace more of a defensive mentality throughout the season, and um, I think you're going to be able to do that big time if everyone buys in. I mean, because you, you have the players to do it, you have the size to do it. It's 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 going to be really interesting to see what the pack looks like on the defensive end of the court, in addition to everything these guys bring offensively. But yeah, Mike James, um, you know. It's someone Louisville really wanted to keep. Um, Louisville was recruiting him really hard, um, trying to retain him. But uh, I think, you know, James just really liked the Wolf Pack. He, the opportunity to play again with Brandon Huntley Hatfield, I heard, was, you know, a factor here. So, um, the Wolf Pack, the coaching staff did a great job getting those two to team up in Raleigh. And um, I think they'll f- form a pretty exciting duo. Um, with our ne- next portal commit, Marcus Hill, who we've mentioned a couple times, because in terms of just pure stats, he is maybe the most impressive player they brought in. At Bowling Green last season, he averaged 20.5 points per game, five rebounds and 2.6 assists, knocking down 44.3% of his shots, which is just awesome efficiency considering um, how many shots per game he was taking um, for Bowling Green. Um, Noah, you, you... you have to be excited about the scoring punch he's going to bring to this team. They needed, I think, another guard who could add that. He was you know, the most recent commit for the Wolfpack. They were looking for a guard who can score in bunches. And Marcus definitely brings that, right? He does. He's going to fill that spot. I'm not saying he's DJ Horn. He's going to fill a spot of, of scoring the basketball at a high clip. You talk about scoring just over 20 points a game. Ethan, he led the – okay, let me back it up. He spent his first few years playing Juco. Went to Bowling Green last year's first year in Division One. While Juco, his sophomore year there, he led all of junior college basketball with 780 points scored in the 2022-23 season. Did it on 49.7% shooting from the field. Not at a high clip from three. That's the one downside he does have. He does like to shoot the three, he told me, but he hasn't done an efficient clip at the college level. Maybe that's one thing that NC State looks to do with him. DJ Horn shot the three pretty well this year, set the single season record for the most in the season. We'll see if they can develop Marcus Hill into a three-point shooter a little bit, add that to his game. But he scores the ball well. He led the MAC in total points, field goals made, and total minutes this year. He led the NCAA. He was sixth in the NCAA in field goals made, 14th in total points. He's also a guy that gets to the basket and draws a lot of fouls while doing so. You know, he shot 46% inside the arc this year. 20, he had 219 free throw attempts this past season, which is 24th most in all of the Division One. Hit 162 of them, which was 37th most in D1. So this is a guy that scores the ball, finds ways to the, get to the basket, and, and, and it's pretty reliable from the free throw line too. So see what he does, and he can defend at a high clip too. He talked about, you know, last year at Bowling Green, being the guy going to his coach saying, I want the best player on the other team. Let me have him, and they would. So he, he can defend too, which is something that's really important in a Kevin Keith system where the offense can do a lot of whatever it wants to do. But defensively, you got to be aggressive. They've got to be sound. They've got to play hard. That's what Kevin Keats wants to see. If he, if he doesn't see that, you're not going to play. And, and Marcus Hill kind of fits both, both ends of the floor for NC State. So we'll see what they do. And just developing his three-point shot, I think, is the, the big key yeah. for this summer going into the season. I, I- He's, he's someone I'm really excited about um, for the pack. I mean, I get the three-point shooting concerns, but I think when you have someone with his scoring talent, the floor, in my opinion, is, just, is a really solid rotational guard who adds you know solid scoring punch. The ceiling for him, like Noah, if he can bring that three-point shooting up, you're looking at someone who could be NC State's best player next year. Like, for sure. 
you, you're looking at someone who, um, I mean, if you've scored 20 points per game, I, I get it, it's in the MAC, but like to, it's D1 basketball. 20.5 points per game is 20.5 points per game. So a lot of talent here. I, I, I'm sure he's someone who had plenty of offers elsewhere. I think he could have gone to a lot of different schools. So um, really, really big addition for the Wolf Pack is someone um, the staff really likes. Um, we're going to see how he fits into the starting lineup. I do think he will carve out a spot in the starting lineup because of, you know, just the fact that you could, he's going to be someone you're going to be able to put the ball in his hands at any moment of any game and just say, go get us a bucket. And um, he's going to be that go-to like DJ Horn type guy this year, I think at least. Um, that's kind of the role that um, he will fill. All right. Um, so we've run through all of the additions. Now, Noah, let's go through really quickly and um, talk through about the subtraction. Sometimes something we do on um, you know, the Wolfpacker.com at times is like an impact analysis where we'll try to assess if someone leaving is a high, low, or medium impact to next season's roster. And um, uh, we try to project the future a little bit there as well. So, Noah, let's run through some departures. Um, I'll try my best to do it in a chronolog chronological order here. But um, let's start with LJ Thomas, um, you know, rotational guard off the bench, hit the portal um, before the ACC tournament run. Um, I, I think he's someone that probably would have played last year, maybe a little bit more than he did with the way that, you know, the uh, portal has shaken out. Like it does seem like there will be some time at backup point guard to um, fill. But uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, we, we can kind of include Cam Woods in this conversation to another um, kind of like end of the bench guard who played sparingly. I don't think I'd, I'd probably classify both of them as low impact for next season. Would you agree? Yeah. You know, LJ Thomas is a guy that played at times, didn't play at times, kind of was in that weird spot. Breon Pass, who's still on the team, was in where you play 10 minutes yeah. in one game, not play for five games, play six minutes, not play. Um, it just didn't work out for him. And, and, and he left the team just before they left for the postseason. So that, that, you know, was unfortunate. Cam Woods, though, a little different story, I feel like, because mm -hmm. he didn't wasn't able to play at the beginning of the season with the yeah. NCAA waiver. They didn't they weren't able to mix him in the practice. Then he could play, so they threw him out there and it didn't really work because he hadn't fit in with the team. It was one of those things where it just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And maybe if he sticks around, they have an opportunity to work him in the practice more. But he wanted to find another place and, and you know, that maybe it was a mutual decision that I, we don't know, but he's off and, and looking for something else. But that was kind of a different, it wasn't that it was all on him. It was more of like, they couldn't work him in. He was on the scout team for all of the preseason and all this stuff. And all of a sudden you try to mix in a guy who yeah, he's similar to Marcus Hill in a way he dominated at North Carolina and T 17.5 points a game there, I believe. And, and played well, just couldn't stick at NC state. Um, you know, unfortunately for him. Yeah, I mean, he was someone we were expecting the red shirt this year because he wasn't eligible. Yep. So um, uh, it was a tough season for him. Hopefully, he lands somewhere great and um, can you know get back to his um, volume scoring ways because he was really good at that before um, before his stop at NC State. Um, all right, next we'll talk about Ernest Ross um, on the court. I'd say um, low to moderate impact. I mean, he's someone that I. I personally really liked watching him whenever he did get in the game, just a high energy guy. I thought made a, a lot of plays. Um, was it, was it, it was the Miami game where um, he, he had um, like an awesome game against the hurricanes and um, was a huge part of that matchup. But um, he, he, he decided to hit the portal. Um, I, I think he would have had a spot in the rotation, like, but it might not have been that different. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong though, but I, I think it kind of would have been sort of a similar role than what he had to what he had this year. Yeah, being that fourth big that there wasn't a lot of options for him. He did play in the ACC championship game, scored a basket. He only scored four points this year, I believe. But, you know, he he scored a big basket there at the end of the first half when there was foul trouble with, with the bigs. Went in there, got a nice dunk. It was a good way to cap. You know, he was one, one of those guys, I think this is going to be more affected in the locker room than it will be on the court. Yeah. He's one of those guys that just has an infectious attitude. Really smart guy. You know, talked to him a bunch during the NCAA tournament run. And and he did a whole lot of the, the three-point goggles on the bench, which, you know, upset Jim Beheim with the ACC tournament. They got their last laugh on it throughout the whole postseason and things like that. But he's a, he's a guy that, that did a lot of good things in the locker room. And 
you know, what are those guys that you need on a team, right? You need the morale guy. You need the guy that's gonna that's gonna keep everybody together. And I think Ernest Ross, you know, wore that, you know, with with pretty dignity. But I will say, his guy didn't play a lot. Didn't play consistent minutes. But he never appeared to really be too down when yeah. that was happening. He always seemed to have a smile on his face. He'd be out there with warm ups, just doing his thing. And I think that's something that just says a lot about his character. And we'll see where he ends up. Absolutely. And um, I, I was thinking about the Miami game um, last season. Last year. It, yeah, it's when, um, it, in the overtime win in um, last January against the Hurricanes. Against, that was when Miami was actually good. <laughs> and that win was um, huge for the season. So, um, that, but um, like you said, high, high impact for the locker room, like su- super fun guy to, to be around. You mentioned the Jim Beheim storyline. I think that was one of the, uh, you know, funniest storylines to follow during this um, tournament run. So uh, again, wishing the best for all of these guys, hoping they all land at um, good spots and um, thrive at, um, at, at their next location. Um, the final guy we need to talk about, and unless I have missed anyone, uh, what is, um, Mo Diara, um, just a, obviously a massive part of the um, NCAA and ACC tournament runs. I mean, he was so good. My personal favorite player to watch on the team, honestly. I thought he was just really, really incredible for most of the season. Um, he decided to pursue professional options. He declared for the um, NBA draft. Um, this is something we kind of heard a little about that might happen. Um, after the tournament run wrapped up, he did head home back to France is, is what I heard. And, uh, you know, it, it's a difficult spot where if, if he's over, um, you know, at NC State, he can't in- earn NIL money because of the way um, visas work. And, you know, he can't technically be an employee of NC State men's basketball and all, all of this sort of stuff. So he wasn't able to earn NIL money. And there's ways around that technically, but it's difficult. And um, he would have to be earning NIL money exclusively when he was in France back home. So, you know, difficult situation for him, you know, makes complete sense. I mean, he, he ended his um, one season Wolfpack tenure on an extremely high note. Um, Noah, um, I think it goes without saying, this is a huge impact for um, NC State. He is a hugely impactful player down the stretch of this past season, and um, he would have played a huge role in, in the he, upcoming year. He would have. And, you know, you look at what he could do. He couldn't earn money here um, just because of the visa he was on, being a native of France and, and things like that. But he played really well in the, in the tournament. You know, averaged nearly a double-double at, at multi-digit rebound games and basically every game he played um, t- until the end. I um, mean, he did it all while fasting during Ramadan. I mean, he has a great story. You know, a guy that's really, really nice off the court, too. And, and one of those guys that really I think a lot of the guys on the team enjoy being around. And there was one year he, he did really well. But you can't blame him for turning pro. His name is as hot as it's going to be with what he did on the national stage. Yep. If he wants to take advantage, try to make it in the NBA, all power to him. That's what he's doing. He's in the NBA draft. He's entered, declared. His name is on the list. And, and the NBA put out this week. We'll see what happens. Worst case scenario for him is goes back to France and plays pro ball there, and and you know, which is not a bad scenario when you're playing yeah. in Europe. So he'll be of demand in Europe if he doesn't stick in the NBA. But I, I think we'll see him in summer league at least. I think I think we'll see some teams give him a chance, see what he can do against NBA competition, and play that power forward spot and see what he can do at six ten. That'd be great. And like you said, um, obviously super impactful on the court. Also just an absolute joy to interview one of the nicest guys on the team in terms of always making time for the media it was always a great quote. Um, re- really, really, um, appreciate he, he, he didn't hide how he felt. He, he'd yeah. tell you. Yeah. He was very honest in his interviews, which, um, no, and I always really appreciated. So good luck, Mo. Um, good luck with your, um, professional pursuits and, um, we'll obviously be rooting for you. All right. Um, that's all for bas- for men's basketball recruiting, but we need to talk about women's basketball because in terms of just like the like prestige of you know a commitment, you know, the women's basketball team brought in one of the top post players in the portal, a major position of need after um, River Baldwin and Mimi Collins, um, their eligibility expired. Um, Katie Pinoetta is um, transferring back to Sacramento State after um, one season with the pack. So they needed to add someone in the um, front court. And they added one, maybe the best 
um, best case scenario for the pack. Um, Caitlin Weimer, um, a Boston Univers former Boston University star forward, um, six foot four, long wingspan, and just a dominant player on both ends of the court. She is the reigning Patriot League Player of the Year overall and Defensive Player of the Year. Um, and she won the Defensive Player of the Year award in back to back seasons. So she is just a really, really good player. Most recently in her senior year, um, she averaged 18.7 points per game and 10.6 boards. So averaging a double double, that's pretty good, Noah. Um, I, I've talked to folks who um, covered her um, during her time at Boston University, and um, everyone is just super excited uh, for her and about what she um, brought to the court for the Terriers um, over the past few years where, I mean, it just elite, an elite rim protector. Yes, she was playing against like shorter competition in general in, in the Patriot League, but, um, you know, really, really good defender, um, you know, quick, agile, can like move her feet. That's one thing that um, NC, NC State's losing this year because River Baldwin was one of the best, um, you know, defensive bigs in terms of like drawing charges and getting in position. Um, I think um, Caitlin's probably going to, you know, might not draw as many charges, but she's going to block a lot more shots. I can tell you that much because she is a really, really good shot blocker. Had a stretch of um, four games in the regular season this spring where um, she blocked at least five shots in a game, hit seven a couple times. So, um, Noah, we, we, I mean, we, we were kind of following along with Caitlin's recruitment because um, she, she came on an official visit, went to Notre Dame, um, you know, there was concern maybe she might end up with the Irish, but she committed to the pack. Um, this is huge. This is huge news for the Wolf Pack. Big addition. I think, you know, we could say it now. She'll probably start in River Baldwin's spot. You know, yeah. bring her in. She's got one year of eligibility left and, and, and playing at a high level as she did. Um, she proves she can play college basketball. We talk about, you know, transferring up and bigger stuff in competition. The ACC being probably one of the best women's basketball, probably the best now that, you know, we can just say it. Like, you know, when you add yeah. Stanford and, you know, a team like that into the mix. Um, it's going to be tough, but I, I don't think it's going to be too big of a challenge. You know, she's an elite player playing in a small school. I think you put an elite player at a, at a program that it's an elite program. It, it, it'll help. Um, but yeah, she plays really well defensively, which NC State needs out of the post because of how well the guards get out and run and transition. And, you know, if you get your post player blocking shots and getting the ball right to, and as I, James, Sanai Rivers, or Zoe Brooks, not even counting like Zamaria Jones or anybody like that. Like this team's looking really good, Ethan. And I think that, you know, Kaylin Weimer is a, is a good spot to that start, you know, for Westmore's, you know, portal. And like, man, this team, final four team a year ago, I'm just going to say now, I don't think they're going to start the year unranked like they did this past season. And uh, <laughs> probably a top five team going into the year. Yeah. I mean, you bring the entire backcourt back. You add um, Zamara, who's a five-star top 20 recruit in the country, McDonald's All-American. And um, the expectations are going to be high. And I thought they really needed to add someone who could be a difference maker in the post. And Caitlin can be exactly that. Um, um, one of my close friends um, and former colleagues, his name's Ethan Fuller. He works at the Boston Globe up in Boston, did a film study with Caitlin during her uh, Boston University career, actually. So um, I called him up just to ask, like, what is she going to bring? And of course, effusively praised her defense. But um, offensively, um, you know, I think she, she, she's not just like going to come in and just protect the rim. And she's going to, you can run the offense through her at times. I think she's going to fill Rivers' um, role in a kind of a similar way where um, sometimes when the offense would stagnate and the guards just couldn't get anything going, they would just, hey, let's just give it to River Baldwin for a few straight post-ups and see what happens. And um, I think um, Caitlin's going to be able to do the exact same thing in Raleigh. I I'm really optimistic about what she's going to bring in the post. She knocked down 55.3% of her field goals um, in her senior season. So I'm um, an efficient player. Uh, almost all of her scoring happens in the paint, so she's not going to be able to like stretch it out to the perimeter or um, I don't think knock down many mid-range jumpers, or at least she hasn't shown that ability yet. But based off of um, what we do know about her, what we do know about her skill set, I think she's just going to be able to fill River Baldwin's role really well and um, a huge, huge addition. Um, I will note, I would not be surprised if she is the only transfer portal addition of the year. Um, based on what I've heard, 
I think the pack will recruit someone if they someone hits the portal that they really like. Um, but other than that, I don't I don't think they're like really really like trying to force anything here. They they have um 13 scholarship players going into next season. That's a lot. That is a lot of players to find um playing time for. Half of these players, uh, actually I should I think almost all of them were top 100 recruits. Um, off the top of my head, I think. 11 of the 13. So, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of talented players who are going to, you know, be competing for playing time. If, yeah, I think if you go in with two open scholarships, that's not the worst thing in the world. They had open scholarships last season. Um, they're going to be deep yeah. either way. So <laughs> it, it'll be um, fun, fun to watch the pack um, with a, a young Wolfpack um, team, aside from the starting backcourt or aside from the starting lineup as a whole, I should say. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you, you talk about, like, open scholarships aren't bad, especially, you know, when you're a team that plays seven people that they played, you know, consistently this past year. It was really six for a while with, yeah. like, a seventh mixed in. Um, I, I do think Westmore will go a little deeper next year. I wouldn't be shocked to see, have it consistently seven and possibly eight. At kind least, of open yeah. up another two player and player two, um, just, just because of the amount of talent that they'll have on the bench. I mean, you talk about Zoe Brooks coming back. Should probably find a way in the starting lineup somehow, but you, you Lacey Steele coming off the bench. You've got, you know, Zamaria Jones, who I don't know if she'll be given as much of a load that Zoe Brooks was given this year, you know, and playing 30 minutes a game off the bench as a freshman. But I, I wouldn't be shocked to see her play 10, 15 no. minutes a game. She's yeah, she's talented enough to do it. Um, and then you go keep going down the line. There's a lot of talent on that bench. Um, so we'll see what happens. And the depth is real. And, and that's one thing that I think – NC State may have learned from playing South Carolina, who they'll see again yep. next year is South Carolina can go one through 15 and play them all. And it's a, I call, there's no drop off. And I think that NC State will be closer to that. They're not, I'm not going to say they're going to be a South Carolina level, but the depth that they'll have on their bench is going to be a lot better than what they have this year. The guard depth will be there. I mean, you have, um, yeah, like you said, Samaria is going to be your, um, like what, fifth guard? potentially sixth guard, like, holy yeah. crap. And that's something you saw with um, South Carolina is you can do a great job defending and even scoring on some of South Carolina's guards. And then it's another five-star recruit, elite <laughs> defender, um, great shooter that they put in the game. Um, so I think it's going to be comparable um, to what South Carolina could do. They're going to have that option where, you know, instead of having to play Isaiah 40 minutes a game, they can sub her out, put Zamaria in, let her, um, you know, um, score as well as she does, play a little bit of defense. And, um, you know, everyone's going to be fresher. Everyone's going to be more energized. It's going to be a really exciting team. Um, and, you know, adding Caitlin just adds, like, feels pretty much the lone question mark. Because I, I think um, you can either run a four-guard lineup with Madison Hayes at power forward, um, something they did at times due to injury this past season, or um, – Maddie Cox, if she takes a step forward, should be able to start and create a taller lineup at um, power forward. So, yeah, really optimistic about um, um, where they're at. And, um, yeah, you know, Noah, um, I think we were both keeping an eye on how the momentum from these final four runs would carry over, see if they could capitalize in the transfer portal. I think it's safe to say both basketball programs did that. So um, as far as, you know, grading how they've done, I'd give both of them an A. and. Um, yeah, that, that's about it for our basketball discussion. Um, before we get out of here, um, did want to mention football recruiting. Um, right now, it's a little bit quiet. Um, that's not something to be concerned about. Like they they have a few open scholarships. They're just not they're not going to rush into anything, right? They're not going to um, offer someone just to offer someone because they have a talented deep team right now. But um, the one player that I would keep an eye on right now is Kerry Martin Jr. Picked up an offer from the pack this afternoon. The former West Virginia in Akron safety um, had a good season for the Zips last year. Um, intercepted a couple passes, um, uh, recorded 45 total tackles. So, you know, productive player in the MAC. Um, a former, you know, freshman All American for the Mountaineers. And um, an interesting note on that is um, you know, he is a senior. Uh, he his first year with the Mountaineers was 2019. So. I believe that would mean um, Tony Gibson probably recruited him 
to um, West Virginia, or he was at least on staff at the time during um, during Kerry's recruitment. So keep an eye on him. We'll see if it materializes and turns into a visit or anything like that. And um, if it does, we'll have an update for you on the Wolfpacker.com. All right. Thank you all for watching and listening today. We really appreciate it. Um, nice to do this again after our quick break. We'll be back whenever there is um, you know, news to talk about. So it could be next week, could be a couple of weeks. Um, but we will be back to um, further discuss um, wh wh where things are going with the Wolfpack. We'll do like a transfer portal wrap up, a look ahead, um, maybe a little more football specific talk before we launch into camp season. The most exciting stretch of the year for football recruiting. And um, we'll talk about it all then. All right. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you soon.